Good morning from Toronto and good evening to Sri Lanka. My name is Burton Lim, Assistant Curator of Mammalogy in the Department of Natural History at the Royal Ontario Museum and one of the curatorial team members who worked on the new exhibition that is now showing at the ROM called Great Whales Up Close and Personal. I'm delighted you could join us for today's Curator Conversations, a digital program that explores themes and subjects associated with ROM collections and research alongside museum and industry professionals. Thank you to TD for their ongoing support of this program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. This virtual event today is in support of our current uh, exhibition, Great Whales, Up Close and Personal, open now until next year, uh, March 20th. We would like to acknowledge the support of our Royal uh, Exhibition Circle donors in making this show possible. My guest for today's curated conversations is uh, Dr. Asha DeVos, an internationally acclaimed marine biologist from Sri Lanka, who is also an ocean educator and pioneer of long-term uh, blue whale research within the Northern Indian Ocean. She is an adjunct a research fellow at the Ocean Institute of the University of Western Australia. Asha received her Bachelor of Science from the University of St. Andrews, Masters of Science from Oxford University, PhD from the University of Western Australia, and postdoc at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is a global scholar, but returned to her home country of Sri Lanka to establish a marine conservation research an education organization called Ocean Swell, which we'll hear more about today. Asha's work has been showcased internationally by the BBC, New York Times, and CNN. She is a National Geographic Explorer and TED Senior Fellow. Among her many accolades, Asha was named to the BBC 100 Women list in 2018, recipient of an inaugural Maxwell Hanrahan Foundation Field Biology Award in 2020, and Scuba Diving Magazine's Sea Hero of the Year in 2020. So how cool is that? Uh, so today's presentation is one of a series of digital and in-person programs that will showcase the ROM's commitment to Canada's uh, iconic whales, including the blue whale and North Atlantic right whale. We'll begin with a short discussion around Ash's experiences in the field and important work she does to help us understand blue whale populations and marine conservation in general. During the program, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature on your screen, and we'll have some time at the end to answer these. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Asha DeVos. Asha, thanks for joining us today. Hi, good evening everyone from sunny, but right now dark Sri Lanka. <laughs> Well, uh, Toronto, uh, we've had quite a bit of rain, so it's morning here, but uh, very dark and overcast. So, so I guess uh, light-wise, we're probably equivalent. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, some, some of our viewers today might remember that in 2017, you came up to Toronto and gave a great talk uh, for our Out of the Depths, the Blue Whale Story exhibition. So uh, during your presentation, you also announced the start of your own marine conservation organization, Ocean Swell. Mm -hmm. So uh, how is that going? Uh, can you give us a four-year update? Yeah, wow. Okay, got a little bit of time. I'm going to try to rush through. But first of all, yes, you know, um, it seems like yesterday, May 2017, when I stood up on your beautiful stage and addressed the audience. And, you know, you know, since in the last few years, we've just been talking in Zoom boxes, I reminisce more and more about those times when I could actually interact with my audiences and have amazing conversations with so many curious people. So I came back to Sri Lanka after that, you know, the, that talk, and I was on literally on the verge of starting Ocean Swell. And in July 2017, we registered the organization. It's Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education organization. So um, you know, we really focus, our mission is to nurture the next generation of diverse ocean heroes, make sure uh, students from all coastlines are equipped to do marine conservation and to engage everyone in the magic of our world's oceans. So with that in mind, you know, we have a massive lineup of cool things. 
the Sri Lankan Blue Well project, which is what I talked about on the stage back in 2017, is now our flagship project and one of many more projects that we run through Ocean Swell. You know, we, we basically focus on anything in Sri Lanka that has um, a conservation concern. Uh, we try to do the research that can help to drive policy changes. And we also translate that research into educational material or outreach activities. And just to give you very, very briefly, you know, we, we've got the Sri Lankan Blue Well project where we're looking at how to stop whales from getting killed by ships. But we're also looking at the impact of the whale watching industry. Then we work with sperm whales, looking at this unique culture of sperm whales out here in Sri Lanka. Um, we work with looking at how a local beach in the city varies over through the year because of our seasonal changes, because we want to bring an awareness to people who use those beaches about like the processes that happen around it. We do emergency projects like as soon as the lockdown happened last year, we were very concerned about how the COVID-19 lockdowns would impact small scale fisher communities. So we did some research around that, which is helping to drive policy change. Uh, right now, um, many of you might know that we had a marine disaster, a ship uh, caught fire just 10 kilometers off the coastline. And there's been this massive spill of nurdles along the coastline, along with other environmental impacts. So we are doing a number of pieces of research uh, to try to aid in the recovery efforts there. And then we have all these amazing education outreach programs, which involve monthly science journal clubs for the public, not just scientists, we cater to everyone. Um, we've got uh, the similar kind of format for kids. Um, we have animation workshops. We encourage kids to, uh, over 10 week programs to build their own videos using that, whatever skills they have to try to get messages out there. So, you know, Ocean Swell is swell, I would say, That's such a bad pun. Um, but also, you know, I, I think, you know, it, I'm so excited with, with what we've been able to achieve in just a short four years. And I really look forward to what we can do as we move forward. Yes, I, I remember when you announced it. Um, I, I think you uh, really, I guess, at that point, you didn't really know, you know, what was going to happen. But, you know, from what you just, uh, you know, said here, like four years, you, you've done a lot of work. Uh, so um, I, I follow you on Twitter. Uh, so I know uh, the stuff that you're doing. Uh, so other people out there, um, if, you know, if you want to uh, hear more about Ocean Swell and what Ash is doing, uh, Twitter, but also um, um, you have your own uh, web page and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I wanted to get to specifically into um, a little bit more detail about, you know, the blue whale research, because I think that's what sort of got you going originally with, you know, marine conservation in general. Um, like in Canada, you know, like, you know, for our uh, exhibition, uh, so like the Northwestern Atlantic population uh, where our blue whale uh, is from, it's estimated mm -hmm. to be about, you know, ranging from two to 400 uh, individuals. Um, but the population in the Indian Ocean that, that where you work in around, you know, the Sri Lankan waters uh, is also interesting. Uh, and you actually call, you know, your whales, the unorthodox whales. Uh, so wh why is that? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, I call them the unorthodox whales because when I started working with them, I had these fixed expectations of what they were going to do based on what I'd learned in my undergrad and, you know, from my textbooks, right? I expected all whales would do these long range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. Now, Sri Lanka is just five degrees above the equator. So it's as warm and tropical as you can get. So obviously all I expected to see there was, you know, mating events and babies being born um, and no feeding. But really what I found, and like this was kind of like my big eureka moment. And I tell people it came in the form of an aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of whale poop. Um, but it's because when I saw that whale poop, I realized that that was evidence of them feeding, right? And they were now, suddenly I realized they were feeding in, these warm waters that are supposed to be not great, you know, in terms of productivity, not enough food for these giants to live in. And so that was like, that was such a big moment for me. And I realized that, you know what, we had these expectations based on what happened with blue whales across the world, when we really had to be open minded to the fact that populations differ based on their environment, they adapt to what's around them. And if these whales don't have to do those large migrations and burn a whole lot of energy just to go down to say Antarctica to feed, when they can just be feeding in these warm tropical waters, 
on something different. And that's what the other thing we found is that they don't feed on krill, which is what blue whales across the world feed on, probably the blue whales that you guys have out there as well, but they feed on a type of shrimp, right? So that's because that's what's available and it makes a lot of sense. And they're getting their nutrients, they're getting their calories, they can still thrive and survive. So why burn energy for no reason? These blue whales also have a different acoustic dialect to blue whales in other parts of the world. So if I could, you know, smuggle a large, rather large Sri Lankan blue whale and bring it across to Canada, drop it in the ocean, they wouldn't be able to communicate because they have different dialects. Our blue whales also have different behaviors. They lift their tail flukes up before a deep dive more often than anywhere else. You know, it's this beautiful, it's like a photographer's dream to see this beautiful tail um, you know, against the sky. I mean, I mean, it's useful for us as scientists because we can use it to identify individuals, you know, photo identification. They have these long-term scarring patterns that are really great for us to know who it is who's visiting our waters over and over again. But the point is, that's not something that, you know, you'll see much in the waters out there. In the Gulf of St. Lawrence, I think it's estimated that they lift their tail flukes up maybe, you know, 12% of the time, whereas we see it almost 60% of the time. So, there are all these different behaviors and, and you know, characteristics of this population, which we know is because they're just adapting to live in that particular part of the world. But that also meant we had to shift our minds. And that was the first time we had really challenged what was known about blue whales across the world in, on the basis that in the tropical waters, well, maybe they just do something different. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because we, we found um, in some, some of our genetic studies that uh, again, from the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the, the two blue whales that we salvaged, um, we, we actually found that they were um, uh, quite similar genetically to uh, populations from the eastern, uh, northeastern Atlantic Oceans around Norway and Iceland. Um, so obviously this, this sort of suggests that there is some type of migration or movement, which, which is sort of different from what, uh, but what, what you see uh, in the northern Indian Ocean and, and around the Sri Lankan uh, uh, population. So, so there is a lot of sort of variation or diversity, you know, that, that we really don't, you know, know a lot about. So we, we need to yeah. study more of the different populations uh, of blue whales ar around all of the oceans. Yeah. So, and also let me just add, sorry, I should have probably said it's the only non-migratory population in the world. Okay. So by that, I mean, they stay in these warm waters. And if you can picture a map of the world, and if you can picture where Sri Lanka is, you know, they basically, if, if I say this is Sri Lanka, the easternmost extent of their range is the east coast of the island. They'll go down to maybe the Maldives, if you can sort of like picture where that is, maybe off to uh, kind of um, the Arabian Sea or the Omani coast. But their, their range is very, very limited, right? So we know they're not doing these long range migrations. They're kind of staying in this area, which is very different to what, you know, what you're describing out there. So super interesting. Yeah. Um, so you say that... Um... Conservation research uh, is, you know, sort of the backbone of ocean swell. So, um, so you, you need to know, uh, you, you need to, you know, work, you know, with the animals uh, and stuff like that, you know, to be able to conserve them. Uh, can you give, um, uh, like, maybe another example of current research you're doing that may, may be um, not blue whale related? Uh, that's yeah. Conservation sure. research related. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, lots of things. So um, so let me talk about the sperm whale work, right, that we do. So we have this really interesting situation where uh, for two, about two weeks of the year on the northwest coast of the island, we have this massive gathering of sperm whales that's not seen anywhere else in the world. And um, it, it's, it's phenomenal to experience, right? So some, you can have like 50, 60 sperm whales coming together. So just for context, in these warm tropical waters, what we top typically will see uh, C is like matrilineal group. So you'll have grandmothers, daughters, and their kids. When the boys mature, they kind of go off on their own to cooler waters and they kind of hang out in bachelor groups uh, while these sort of maternal groups stick together throughout the year uh, within these tropical waters. So we get to see these bigger groups. Um, and, it, and the purpose of our research, and, and actually, you know what, one of my collaborators is Canadian, Dr. Shane Garrow, from, uh, who actually runs the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. Shane lives in Ontario, actually. So there you go. Fun fact. 
Um, and you should check out his work because it's really fascinating. He comes out of Hal Whitehead's lab, which is at Dalhousie, which is, you know, they've the, got a whole lineage of sperm whale researchers coming out of there. But we collaborate with him because the purpose of our project is to be able to compare and contrast what we see in Sri Lanka with their work, which has been 15 years long. And, you know, with sperm whales, they actually have culture, which is fascinating, right? So they have... Um, you know, they'll have specific vocal dialects in what we call a unit. And a unit will be a grandmother, her kids, and her their kids, right? That's one unit. And within that, they'll have a specific vocal dialect. And then within the larger group, they'll have one that's common, right? So you see this social learning going through either mothers teaching babies or like, you know, peers teaching each other, which is a form of culture. And I, I find this really fascinating. But why it's important in conservation is because if you say like this unit is as a different call to this unit and this unit, if we don't protect every single unit, right? And one of them gets eradicated, then, you know, for through human negligence, which is really what's going on in the world today, then, you know, we're losing a culture, right? And so for us, it's about understanding what are these cultures and trying to best protect them into the future so that, and, and understanding what is actually different species have, you know, have we have to think about their pr protection in very different ways, right? So here with sperm whales, we know because they have so much culture at these smaller levels, well, to really protect that species, we do need to protect the smaller units as well. And so that's super fascinating to, to me. And, and a fun fact is that, you know, when Shane came out to Sri Lanka, now he's worked in Dominica, he's worked in the Galapagos, he's got extensive experience working with sperm whales across the world. I mean, it was awesome to see his face when he saw our sperm whales because suddenly he was like, wow, these females are huge, right? Like, and I was like, yes, like, go tropics, we feed you well, you know, I was super excited. And, you know, they have markings that indicate that they're potentially older females. But, so these are things that we're really interested in trying to understand, like, okay, if they're older females, is this a really good feeding ground? What is allowing them to feel safe enough to hang around here? Um, so, so many, so many questions, huge questions in mind, but like all of these are, you know, we're gonna chip away slowly um, and, and also try to understand what are they feeding on? And next year, very excitingly, we're hoping to drop a National Geographic drop cam uh, into the water. It can go down to 6,000 meters to do some deep sea water, you know, deep underwater research where we can, film the environment and sort of potentially see this incredible three-dimensional space that these, these deep diving gi giants live in. Okay, well, obviously we're gonna have to get you back here for another presentation next year then. <laughs> um, so uh, one of your passions is educating uh, people about the oceans. Uh, so what, what's an outreach uh, program or project uh, that you're doing now and uh, that you're excited about? Yeah, you know, so we so we do lots of things, as I said, uh, um, but um, one of the things that we've done for, oh, you know, the first, so we do this thing called Marine Conservation Conversations. It's a monthly science journal club for the public, right? And now that might sound daunting, but it's not at all. What I do for that session is I, if you, re when people register, we just send out a, a scientific paper that I've picked. So usually it's one of the nicer ones, which are, interesting, exciting, has a good story, but also is very easily readable. One of the main things there is that I want people to realize that every, science is for everyone, right? Like I don't believe that science is just for scientists and you have to have a degree. I think everyone should be able to access science, have access to really good quality information, right? And so I want people to feel comfortable kind of digesting that material and not feeling like, oh, I, I, I didn't, I'm not old enough or I don't have that specific degree. That is like, I want to dispel all of that. And I actually started this event in July, 2017, right? So I've tried to keep it every month, but I, when I travel, obviously sometimes it's difficult because I host this event. We've had 29, we had the last one two, two nights ago, actually, um, where we've discussed a range of topics from still fisheries in Sri Lanka. The last one we did was how seabird guano, which is accumulations of seabird poop, actually helped Incan empires prosper and grow, right? Um, I'm telling you, I pick all the fun papers. We looked at how um, um, uh, cultural uh, changes in sperm whale populations, how sperm whale populations moved out of an area and how a different culture of sperm whales moved into certain areas. We talked about how, we've talked about how menus can tell us what species of fish have gone um, commercially extinct because 
suddenly they're not in menus. And if you look back in history and you, you can see how certain species have been removed off menus because they were just not available to be served in restaurants. So, you know, to me, it's a fun event because the people who join are accountants, bakers, business people, like we'll have some people with science backgrounds, but really everyone comes in and it's a, it's, um, you know, an event where I tell people it's a safe space and people come and we have kids of like from the age of eight coming in. So and people, now that we're on Zoom, it used to be in a room and we'd sit around and eat cake and discuss, which was obviously so much better because cake is always good. But now we do it on Zoom, which means we can attract people from across the world. And I would say that's my top favorite event. And we have a similar event for under 15s, um, which we also run on a monthly basis, which is we send out a fun video and have the kids discuss that over half an hour. And it's amazing to see how kids get super into it and come with that. They've done their research. They come with their own fun facts. And, and um, yeah, so we do similar, lots of events, but those two were probably my two favorite ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, the the COVID pandemic has you know affected everybody um, uh, in you know numerous ways, uh, and you sort of mentioned it. Um, but uh, yeah, so so yeah, so so actually, sort of good and bad. So um, <coughs> Zoom can sort of help in some respects. So you get more of an international connection, uh, but you but it's hard to get that uh, in 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 person um, sort of exposure or feeling. Um, so, so just in general, um, I guess elaborate, you know, more further on, you know, how, how has COVID affected you and how has that affected, you know, getting your conservation message out, um, you know, so obviously you have, you know, the, you know, your education programs in Sri Lanka, but how, how do you get that out? How, how do you do your science communication, you know, to a global audience? Yeah. Okay. During the pandemic. During the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I will say that, you know, COVID just was like, it was, um, it really shook, obviously shook things up for everyone, uh, took us by surprise. I mean, I was actually actually in the field doing research with blue whales, like, and then we finished our field season, and literally two days later, Sri Lanka went into um, work from home, and two days after that, we went into our first lockdown, right? So cut it really fine. Um, that means since 2020, early 2020, we haven't really been able to go out in the field, uh, which has obviously been a bit of a bummer for us because we always have these great plans for things to do. And, um, but of course, given the circumstances, totally understand. But I think the one thing COVID taught, um, taught me and, you know, through my organization also was you have to just learn to be adaptable, right? Like we could have sat at home and been like, well, we can't reach the public. So what do we do? But we did, we just had to be like, you know what, let's, and, and my goal in the first lockdown, because it just felt never ending, was that as people were locked in their homes, I didn't want them to forget the oceans. So we did two things. We built two series um, just online. One was um, Ocean Creature Feature, where we featured a really fun, unusual ocean creature. Uh, like it was like a three minute video. And then we'd, we made like accompanying kids packs because we thought, well, parents probably need a little bit of a timeout. So maybe the child can do like a coloring and learn to draw this species and then do a crossword or something like that. And then we also did a series called uh, Tiny Desk Adventures, where I brought in, you know, one of the nice things about kind of like having lived and worked in different places, because I've got this like amazing network of people who are very generous. And so we featured scientists from across the world who did very different things in the marine conservation space. Um, and they came in and they made little videos for us. And then we had discussions so I could bring, you know, a little bit of the world to Sri Lanka as well. So similarly, you know, I tend to use social media a lot um, I, because I just believe that, you know, when I die, I don't want it to end and I don't want to die with everything I know in my head. I do want everyone to have that information, right? Like, what's the point otherwise? So I tend to use social media and storytelling is really something I'm really passionate about. Um, I think science can be super fun if we engage people through stories. And so I try to use that medium. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, I'll try anything to engage with people and across the world. Yeah. Zoom has been my best friend, but I can say I do miss standing on your stage and talking to people, but then after the event, you know, having people come and ask questions and just having that. So I'm really looking forward to the day we can do that again. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to work, uh, work you into uh, next year if, uh, if things uh, get better. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, 
And I'm sure there's tons of questions from the audience. Um, so let's uh, formally end our curator con conversations uh, for now. Um, so um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ashley DeVos for joining us today uh, and also our virtual audience. Um, now that the ROM is open to the public, I uh, hope that uh, people will be able to visit the ROM's uh, special exhibitions, uh, including great whales up close and personal and learn more about these fascinating animals. Uh, Asha and I will be answering some of your questions for the next few minutes. Uh, as a reminder, uh, these can be submitted through the Q&A feature uh, on your screen. Okay, so let me navigate to my Q&A and see if I can do this here. Um, okay, so uh, at the top of my list here, uh, okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll just read these out. Uh, I'd love to uh, do more uh, to quiet oceans, especially from cargo ships for whale health. Not sure how to get involved and feel like I'm actually helping make change. What advice do you have? Quietening cargo ships is such an important thing. I mean, I you know, the ocean is getting noisier as our needs grow. Um, there are organizations that do work on this. For example, the International Maritime Organization. Um, I myself, I guess I work on the animal side of things. So I, I mean, I don't really have a lot of advice um, except to say perhaps reach out to uh, organizations like the World Shipping Council because they are, so the World Shipping Council kind of manages most of the world shipping fleets, but they are becoming increasingly uh, conscious of uh, the environment that they're working in um, with the understanding that, you know, 90% of everything is shipped, so we're all to blame. And I think we're all kind of trying to come together to find solutions. And ocean noise is definitely a really big problem for the oceans that we rarely um, think about or talk about because we think about going to the ocean and it's meditative and colorful. And I, and, 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 but just give me a second. I want to give, tell you this really exciting science story um, about ocean noise, just to kind of describe it a bit better for everybody. And it involves the North Atlantic right whales. And so in, the, in off Boston, there's been long-term research on the North Atlantic right whales, which I know is one of the skeletons that you have up in the uh, exhibit as well. And they've been collecting uh, whale poop for a long time out there. That team has been doing extensive research out of the New England Aquarium, collecting whale poop to, uh, to look at uh, cortisol levels or stress hormones. And they were collecting it you know, before 9-11 happened, once 9-11 happened and then after 9-11. And they found this really interesting thing. They found that soon after 9-11 happened, the stress levels of these North Atlantic right whales actually dropped. And everyone was confused because we were like, wait a second, like people were in, you know, stressed as ever. And the whales were just like, chill, this is awesome. And then they realized that what happened was that they actually stopped shipping in the Bay of Fundy at that point and that area. And when they stopped sh shipping, noise levels dropped. And when the noise levels dropped, the animals obviously got less stress. As soon as they opened up shipping again, they saw the stress levels go up, right? So so thank you for wanting to work in that space. It's incredibly important. If you have the skill, I'm sorry, I can't give you much more advice apart from just really telling you that what you want to do is really, really important. Yeah, yeah that's no, a great answer. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the blue whales of the Indian Ocean are unusual and have adapted in unexpected ways to that environment. What kind of time frame does this amount of adaptation involve and can whales readapt to things like the challenges of warming waters? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think it probably takes generations for them to evolve and adapt. Um, we don't know the timeframes, particularly for the uh, population out here in Sri Lanka, because they haven't been genetically tested yet for various reasons. So we don't really, we know that they're sort of a subpopulation of pygmy blue whales. Don't let that name mislead you because they're not pocket sized. They're still like 20, 20 meters long. But, um, you know, so we don't know if we had the genetics, we'd probably be able to see how far back they branched off. And based on that, we could probably make assumptions on like kind of when they decided we're not going to do these big travels anymore. We're just going to pack, unpack our bags and settle in here because it's so much nicer to be in the tropics, right? Um, so, yeah, so I don't, I don't really have an answer in terms of timescales, but definitely many, many generations. And with climate change, 
So species can, the thing when, you know, with, you, with warming temperatures and stuff, the thing that things that species can do is um, adapt, migrate or die, right? Like those are their options. And we like to think that they can adapt if climate change or warming temperatures, et cetera, are happening slow enough. But the problem with what's going on in the world today is that it's happening at a much more rapid rate than it has ever happened before. So will species be able to keep uh, you know, abreast or stay one step ahead is something that we're all still trying to figure out. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so obviously climate change is, uh, is a whole complicated issue that, uh, yeah. that, that, we, that we still need to learn more about. Uh, okay, so the next question is, uh, I'm really interested in marine life and the aquatic system, uh, but I would love to have a more hands-on uh, experience helping the animals, uh, helping animals job compared to research. Uh, how, uh, however, I'm unaware what those types of jobs could be. Uh, yeah, so I, so I guess a more hands-on as opposed to a research-related uh, job uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with whales. So more field work type work. Yeah, so I, I mean, my recommendation, there's multiple recommendations. I would say, first of all, maybe you can email my organization info at oceanswell.org. We, we have some material that we can share to give you some advice. But I would also say the other way, if you are interested in looking for experiences and, and opportunities to engage in field work, um, you can subscribe to the MAR MAM mailing list. It's M-A-R-M-A-M. Um, and if you subscribe to that, it's free to subscribe. That's where a lot of marine mammal researchers, whale researchers will advertise uh, field opportunities or internships or you know whatever else is available. And that's a good way for you to know what's out there and then maybe apply for something. Um, and you know, really figure out what your skills are and look at what's, what they're looking for and try to match your skills to their needs. And that's gonna give you the best possible chance in getting an opportunity. Okay, good advice. Um, okay, so uh, can you share more about cultural details of sperm whales and blue whales too? And I'll, I'll give a plug to the exhibition because we, we do talk about uh, culture and whales ourselves. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll let you yeah. give a, a detailed answer here. Yeah, so um, I would say go check out the exhibition. I will say the blue whale exhibit that they had in 2017 was absolutely beautiful, beautifully detailed. And it had something for everyone. So I'm also going to give it a plug. Um, and I'm sad that I can't be that myself, but I am still hopeful. But I'm still hopeful. But that's a side note. Um, but, um, you know, so, so we, I mean, traditionally, we've always thought that culture was a thing that humans had, right? Like, because we never, we thought culture was, you know, being able to use cutlery right? Like that was kind of culture. And, and there were so many different definitions and it seemed to preclude the animal kingdom. But now we've got wiser to that. And with sperm whales, we certainly know that they, their culture is where they pass on language abilities, like I said, from grandmother to child to grandchild, right? Um, and they also can teach things a, a horizontally. So you might have a, a, brother, uh, you know, a sibling teaching another sibling or a mother and her sister kind of like teaching each other something. It could be what they're feeding on, right? So these units that I talked about, which is the grandmother's daughters and their children might have a different uh, preference for, and, I mean, they tend to feed on squid. They might prefer a different kind of squid to the other unit that's next to them, right? They might be swimming in the same waters, but they might actually feed on something a little different because culturally their preference was a little different, right? And so that's the kind of culture we're seeing in terms of their dialect, their vocalizations, and their feeding preferences with the sperm whales. But if you think about it, even with the blue whales, right? Like they're culturally different because they've adapted and they've got these um, different dialects in the, the, you know, the population around Sri Lanka, which is the Northern Indian Ocean blue whale population. They're feeding, what they feed on is different. Their behaviors are different. So that means they're not just, you know, they're potentially culturally different, um, sorry, potentially genetically different. Um, they're definitely acoustically different because they speak different dialects, but they're also culturally different in the way they behave in the environment and how they share what they know with those around them. So culture is actually all around us. It's just now we've learned that it can be def defined in a more broader way. And that allows us to see it in all these other species too. Yeah, yeah I think that's a sort of a great connection between 
humans and whales is that uh, culturally um, is stuff that you know we can sort of identify with uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, I think this might be the last one because uh, this is the last one that's been left on my uh, Q and A. <laughs> the other questions being filtered out um, uh, for repeats and stuff like that. Uh, so, what's your assessment of the whale watching tourism industry in Sri Lanka? Uh, as in, do you see it as a force for good, or are there concerns about whether whale watching tours are done ethically? Okay, that's a really great question. And thank you for asking because that kind of segues into some of the research that we've been doing, uh, where we are looking at the impact of the whale watching industry on the population of whales and looking at the interactions. So we're looking at everything from understanding, you know, tourists and what their expectations are and how advertising can skew the expectation of a tourist, which could lead to encounters that are detrimental to the species. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, actual interactions between boats and whales and looking at whether they're getting too close or not getting, you know, like are being respectful because we do have guidelines, but they don't tend to seem to listen to the guidelines which is a very unfortunate thing. So we're looking at from multiple angles and this is a bit of a work in progress, but just you know, from my observations of being out on the water for years, seeing the industry, particularly on the South Coast, go from two or being working out there before there were any whale watching boats to being out there when there were two, initially when the whale watching industry started, two boats to like now there's like um, at the last count, they had given out 56 permits uh, that that's you know a handful of owners owning 56 boats that go out and there's no regulation about how many of those boats can be out at a time each boat can carry you know 40 to 80 people um, if there's if it's you know a year where there are lots of whales close to shore I, I mean the whale movement is dependent on kind of currents and circulation and where the food is but sometimes if the food is really close to shore and the whales are kind of like there's lots of whales around it's not as bad because the boats spread out but if they're kind of more further out and kind of take a little longer to find, if there's a whale close to shore, all the boats surround them and they can be, you know, really kind of crazy around them. And I always say, you know, it's like, we might think it's like, like a, you know, it's like a mosquito, right? Constantly buzzing at your head. But after a point, you're going to get up and move, right? Because that's not, not comfortable. Um, and I, I, I always tell people, I said, look, we have to start to like be more empathetic uh, as we live, work in these spaces. I mean, if you think about it, right? It's like, you know, if you're having Sunday lunch with your family and, and you're, you know, in your pajamas and hanging out because it's just family and you're eating ice cream and you're having a great time and a, a stranger comes into your house unannounced, doesn't ring the doorbell, just comes crashing through your front door, playing really loud music in a boom box, right? And then like littering everywhere, right? That's really uncomfortable. And that's, you know, and, and that's kind of what we do when we go into these spaces. And we have to remember that, if we want to be respected in our homes, we have to learn to respect these animals in theirs. And that's a fundamental thing. And I do think that in whale watching in general, it's not perfect. The industry is not perfect. It's quite a new industry. We still don't fully understand what the long-term impacts can be of boats constantly going up to animals and looking at them, whether they're getting close with this thing away, right? But you know what? It's great that people are getting curious and seeing these animals. How we do it matters. And that's, yes, I think it can be done a lot better here in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I think we definitely need um, uh, to do a lot more, you know, from a, you know, conservation perspective for whales um, and, you know, just, you know, the wildlife animals uh, on earth in general. Mm -hmm. um, okay, actually, unfortunately, uh, or time has, uh, <laughs> has run out. Um, so now uh, we'll just end up um, uh, closing it off here. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us uh, on today's curator's conversations. And, and thanks again to Dr. Ashley DeVos for an engaging discussion. Uh, we hope to see you again for our next digital program. Details of all upcoming ROM at Home online programs can be found on the ROM website and our social media channels. Have a good rest of the day or evening. Thank you, everybody. It's been great to be here, and I hope to meet you all in person in the near future. Good night.